Throughout quarter one, as we are reading about American exploration, we're going to also read certain chapters from John Krakauer's book, Into the Wild, about a young boy who is traveling around the United States in, with a desire to explore the world around him. And we're going to consider the struggles and challenges that he faces throughout his adventure and what consequences he may face. Okay, the author's note explains to us his motivations for writing this book. In April 1992, a young man from a well-to-do East Coast family hitchhiked to Alaska and walked alone into the wilderness north of Mount McKinley. Four months later, his decomposed body was found by a party of moose hunters. Shortly after the discovery of the corpse, I was asked by the editor of Outside Magazine to report on the puzzling circumstances of the boy's death. His name turned out to be Christopher Johnson McCandless. He'd grown up, I learned, in an affluent suburb of Washington, D.C., where he'd excelled academically and had been an elite athlete. Immediately after graduating with honors from Emory University in summer of 1990, McCandless dropped out of sight. He changed his name, gave the entire balance of a $24,000 savings account to charity, abandoned his car and most of his passion possessions, burned all of the cash in his wallet, and then he invented a new life for himself, taking up residence at the ragged margin of our society, wandering across North America in search of raw, transcendent experience. His family had no idea where he was or what had become of him until his remains turned up in Alaska. Working on a tight deadline, I wrote a 9,000 word article, which ran in January of 1993 issue of the magazine. But my fascination with McCandless remained long after that issue of The Outside was replaced on the newsstands by more current journalistic fare. I was haunted by the particulars of the boy's starvation and by vague, unsettling parallels between events in his life and those in my own. Unwilling to let McCandless go, I spent more than a year retracing the convoluted path that led to his death in the Alaska Tiaga. Chasing down details of his pre-generation peregrinations with an interest in bordered on obsession. In trying to understand McCandless, I inevitably came to reflect on other larger subjects as well. The grip wilderness was on the American imagination, the allure high risk activities hold for young men of a certain mind, the complicated, highly charged bond that exists between fathers and sons. The result of this meandering inquiry is the book now before you. I won't claim to be an impartial bi biographer. McCandless's strange tale struck a personal note that made a dispassionate rendering of the t tragedy impossible. Through most of the book I have tried and largely succeeded, I think to minimize my authorial presence, but let the reader be warned. I interrupt McCandless's story with fragments of a narrative drawn from my own youth. I do so in the hope that my experiences will throw some oblique light on the enigma of Chris McCandless. He was an extremely intense young man and possessed a streak of stubborn idealism that did not mesh re readily with modern existence. Long captiv captivated by the writing of Leo Tolstoy, McCandless particularly admired how the great novelist had forsaken a life of wealth and privilege to wander among the dis destitute. In college, McCandless began emulating Tolstoy's aestheticism and moral rigor to a degree that first astonished and then alarmed those who were close to him. When the boy headed off into the Alaska bush, he entertained no illusions that he was trekking into the land of milk and honey, peril and adversity, and Tolstoyan renunciation were precisely what he was seeking, and that is what he found in abundance. For most of the 16-week ordeal, nevertheless, McCandless more than held his own. Indeed, were it not for one or two seem, seemingly insignificant blunders, he would have walked out of the woods in August 1992, as, an anonym, as anonymously as he had walked into them in April. Instead, his innocent mistakes turned out to be pivotal and irresistible. His name became the stuff of tabloid headlines and his bewildered family was left clutching the shards of a fierce and painful love. A surprising number of people have been affected by the story of Chris McCandless' life and death. In the weeks and months following the publication of the article and Outside, 
it generated more mail than any other article in the magazine's history. This correspondence, as one might expect, reflected sharply divergent points of view. Some readers admired the boy immensely for his courage and noble ideals. Others fulminated that he was a reckless idiot, a wacko, a narcissist who persisted out of arrogance and stupidity, and was undeserving of the considerable media attention he received. My convictions should be apparent soon enough, but I will leave it to the reader to form his or her own opinion of Chris McCandless. So chapter eight, it may after all be the bad habit of creative talents to invest themselves in pathological extremes that yield remarkable insights, but no durable way of life for those who cannot translate their psychic wounds into significant and or thought. Theodore Rozak in Search of the Miraculous. We have in America the two big two-hearted river tradition, taking your wounds to the wilderness for a cure a conversation, a rest, or whatever. And as in the Hemingway story of if your wounds aren't too bad, it works. But this isn't Michigan for Faulkner's big woods in Mississippi, for that matter. This is Alaska. By Edward Hoagland, Up at the Black to Chalsic. With, when McCandless turned up dead in Alaska and the perplexing circumstances of his demise were reported in the news media, many people concluded that the boy must have been mentally disturbed. The articles about McCandless and Outside generated a large volume of mail, and not a few of the letters heaped up opprobrium on McCandless and on me as well, the author of the story, for glorifying what some thought was a foolish, pointless death. Much of the negative mail was sent to Al by Alaskans. Alex is a nut in my book, wrote a resident of Healy, the, the hamlet at the head of the Stampede Trail. The author describes a man who has given away a small fortune, forsaken a loving family, abandoned his car, watched and map, and burned the last of his money before traipsing off into the wilderness <clears throat> west of Healy. Personally, I see nothing positive at all about Chris McCandless's life, a wilderness doc doctrine scolded another correspondent. Entering the wilderness purposely ill-prepared and surviving a near-death experience does not make you a better human. It makes you damn lucky. One reader in the outside piece wondered, why would anyone intending to live off the land for a few months forget Boy Scout num rule number one? Be prepared. Why would any son cause his parents and family such permanent and perplexing pain? Krakauer is a kook if he doesn't think Chris Alexander Supertramp McCandless was a kook, opined a man from North Pole, Alaska. McCandless had already gone over the edge and just happened to hit bottom in Alaska. The most strident criticism came in the form of a dense, multi-page epistle from Ambler, a tiny impute village in the Kobuk River north of the Arctic Circle. The author was a white writer and school teacher, formerly from Washington, B.C., British Columbia, named Nick Jans, warning that it was 1 a.m. and he was well into a bottle of Seagram's Jans Let Fly. Over the past 15 years, I've run into several McCandless type out in the country. Same story, idealistic, energetic, young guys who overestimated themselves, overestimated the country, and ended up in trouble. McCandless was hardly unique. There's quite a few of these guys hanging around the state, so much alike that they're almost a collective cl cl cliche. The only difference is that McCandless ended up dead, with the story of his dumb, his dumb acidness splashed across the media. Jack London got it right in To Build a Fire. McCandless is finally just a pale 20th century, century burlesque London's protagonist who freezes because he ignores advice and commits big-time debris. His ignorance, which could have been cured by a USGS quadrant and a Boy Scout manual, is what killed him. And while I feel for his parents, I have no sympathy for him. Such willful ignorance amounts to disrespect for the land and paradoxically demonstrates the same sort of arrogance that resulted in the Exxon Valdez spill. Just another case of unprepared, un overconfident men bumbling around out there and screwing up because they lack the requisite humility it's all a matter of degree. McCandless's contrived aestheticism and pseudo-literary stance compound rather than reduce the fault. 
McCandless's postcards, notes, and journals, read like a work of an above-average, somewhat histrionic high school kid, or am I missing something? The prevailing Alaskan wisdom held that McCandless was simply one more dreamy, half-cocked greenhorn who went into the country expecting to find answers to all his problems, and instead found only mosquitoes and lonely death. Dozens of marginal characters have marched off into Alaska's wilds over the years, never to reappear. A few have lodged firmly in the state's collective memory. There was the countercultural idealist who passed through the village of T Tanana in the early 1970s, announcing he intended to spend the rest of his life communing with nature. In midwinter, a field biologist discovered all his belongings, two rifles, camping gear, a diary filled with incoherent rantings about truth and beauty and recondite ecological theory, in an empty cabin near Tofty, its interior filled with drifted snow. No trace of the young man was ever found. A few years later, there was a Vietnam vet who built a cabin on the Black River east of the Chalky Stick and get to get away from people. By February, he'd run out of food and starved, apparently without making any attempt to save himself, despite the fact that there was another cabin stocked with meat just three miles downstream. Writing about his death, Edward Hoagland observed that Alaska is not the best site in the world for aromatic experiments or peace love theatrics. And then there was the wayward genius I bumped into on the shore of Prince William Sound in 1981. I was camped in the woods outside Cordova, Alaska, trying in vain to find work as a deckhand for a CNE boat. Biding my time until the Department of Fish and Game announced the first opener, the start of the commercial salmon season. One rainy afternoon while walking into town, I crossed paths with an, with an unkempt, agitated man who appeared to be about 40. He wore a bush-like black beard and shoulder-length hair, which he kept out of his face with a headband made from a 50 nylon strap. He was walking toward me in a brisk clip, hunched beneath the considerable weight of a six-foot log balanced across one shoulder. I said hello as he approached, and he mumbled a reply, and we paused to chat in the drizzle. I didn't ask why he was carrying a sodden log into the forest, where there seemed to be plenty of logs already. After a few minutes spent exchanging earnest banalities, we went our separate ways. From our brief conversation, I deduced that I had just met the celebrated eccentric whom the locals called the mayor of Hippie Cove, a reference to a bite of tidewater north of town that was a magnet for long-haired transients near which the mayor had been living for some years. Most of the residents of Hippie Cove were like me summer squatters who'd come to Cordova hoping to score high-paying fishing jobs or failing that fine work in the salmon canaries. But the mayor was different. His real name was Gene Rossellini. He was the eldest stepson of Victor Rossellini, a wealthy Seattle re restauranteur, the cousin of Albert R Rossellini, the immensely popular governor of Washington State from 1957 to 1965. As a young man, Jean had been a good athlete and a brilliant student. He read obsessively, practiced yoga, became expert at the martial arts. He sustained a perfect 4.0 grade point average through high school and college. At the University of Washington and later at Seattle University, he immersed himself in anthropology, history, philosophy, and linguistics, accumulating hundreds of credit hours without collecting a degree. He saw no reason to. The pursuit of knowledge, he maintained, was a worthy objective in its own right and needed no external validation. By and by, Rossellini left academia, departed Seattle, and drifted north up the coast through British Columbia and the Elastic Pan Alaska Panhandle. In 1977, he landed in Cordova. There in the forest at the edge of the town, he decided to devote his life to an ambitious anthropological experiment. I was interested in knowing if it was possible to be independent of modern technology, he told Anchorage Daily News reporter Deborah McKinney, a decade after arriving in Cordova. He wondered whether humans could live as our forebearers had when mammoths and saber-toothed tires roamed the land, or whether our species had moved too far from its roots to survive without gunpowder, steel, and other artifacts of civilization. With the obsessive attention to detail that characterized his brand of dogged genius, Rossellini purged his life of all but the most primitive tools, which he fashioned from native materials with his own hands. 
He became convinced that humans had devolved into progressively inferior beings, McKinney explains, and it was his goal to return to a natural state. He was forever experimenting with different eras, Roman times, the Iron Age, the Bronze Age. By the end, his lifestyle was uh, with, had elements of Neolithic. He dined on roots, berries, and seaweed, hunted game with spears and snares, dressed in rags, endured the bitter winters. He seemed to relish the hardship. His home above Hippie Cove was a windowless hovel, which he built without benefit or of saw or axe. He'd spend days, said McKinney, grinding his way through a log with a sharp stone. As if merely subsisting according to his self-imposed rules weren't strenuous enough, Rossellini also exercised compulsively whenever he wasn't occupied with foraging. He filled his days with calisthenics, weightlifting, and running often with a load of rocks on his back. During one apparently typical summer, he reported covering on average of, an average of 18 miles daily. Rossellini's experiment stretched on for more than a decade, but eventually he felt the question that inspired it had been answered. In a letter to a friend, he wrote, began my adult life with the hypothesis that it would be possible to become a Stone Age native. For over 30 years, I programmed and conditioned myself to this end. In the last 10 of it, I would say I realistically experienced the physical, mental, and emotional reality of the Stone Age. But to borrow a Buddhist phrase, eventually came to a setting face-to-face -face with pure reality. I learned that it is not possible for human beings, as we know them, to live off the land. Rossellini appeared to accept the failure of his hypothesis with equanimity. At the age of 49, he cheerfully announced that he was, had recast his goals and, need, and next intended to walk around the world living out of my backpack. I want to cover 18 to 27 miles a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The tri trip never got off the ground. In November 1991, Rossellini was discovered lying face down on the floor of his shack with a knife through his heart. The coroner determined that the fatal wound was self-inflicted. There was no suicide note. Rossellini left no hint as to why he had decided to end his life then and in that manner. In all likelihood, nobody will ever know. Rossellini's death and the story of his outlandish existence made the front page of the Anchorage Daily News. The travails of John Mal Malin Waterman however, attracted less attention. Born in 1952, Waterman was raised in the same Washington suburbs that gave shape to Christmas candles. His father, Guy Waterman, is a musician and freelance writer who, among other claims to modest fame, authored speeches for presidents, ex-presidents, and other prominent Washington politicians. Waterman Pierre also happens to be an expert mountaineer who taught his three sons to climb at an early age. John, the middle son, went rock climbing for the first time at 13. He was a natural. John headed to the crags in every opportunity and trained obsessively when he couldn't climb. He cranked out 400 push-ups every day and walked two and a half miles to school fast. After walking home in the afternoon, he touched the front door and headed back to the school to make a second round trip. In 1969, as a 16-year-old boy, John climbed Mount McKinley, which he called Denali, as, his Alas as most Alaskans do, preferring the peak's Athapaskan name. Becoming the third youngest person to stand atop the highest landform on the continent. Over the next few years, he pulled off even more impressive ascents to Alaska, Canada, and Europe. By the time he enrolled in the University of Alaska at Fairbanks in 1973, Waterman had established a reputation as one of the most promising young alpinists in North America. Waterman was a small person, barely five feet three inches tall, with an elfin face and a sin sinewy, inexhaustibly physique of, of a gymnast. Acquaintances remember him as a socially awkward man-child with an outrageous sense of humor and a squirrely, almost manic-depressive personality. When I first met John, says James Brady, a fellow climber and college friend, he was prancing across campus in a long black cape and blue Elton John glasses that had a star between the lenses. He carried around a cheap guitar held together with masking tape and would serenade anybody who'd listen with long, off-key songs about his adventures. Fairbanks had always attracted a lot of weird characters, but he was wacky even by Fairbanks' standards. Yeah, John was out there. A lot of people didn't know how to handle him. It is not difficult to imagine plausible cases of Waterman's instability. His parents, Guy and Emily Waterman, divorced when he was a teen, and Guy, according to a source close to the family, essentially abandoned his sons following the divorce. He would have nothing more to do with the boys, and it crippled John badly. 
Not long after their parents split up, John and his older brother, Bill, went to visit their father, but Guy refused to see them. Shortly after that, John and Bill went to Fairbanks to live with an uncle. At one point while they were up there, John got very excited because he heard that his father was coming to Alaska to climb. But when Guy arrived in the state, he never took the trouble to see his sons. He came and went without even bothering to visit. It broke John's heart. Bill, with whom John had an extremely close relationship, lost a leg as a teenager trying to hop a freight train. In 1973, Bill posted an enigmatic letter alluding vaguely to plans for an extended trip and then disappeared without a trace. To this day, nobody knows what became of him. And after John learned to climb, eight of his in intimates and climbing partners were killed in accidents or committed suicide. It's not much of a stretch to posit that such a rash misfortune dealt the serious blow to Waterman's young psyche. In March 1978, Waterman embarked on his most astonishing expedition, a solo ascent of Mount Hutner's southeast spur, an unclimbed route that had previously defeated three teams of elite mountaineers. Writing about the feat in Climbing Magazine, the journalist Glenn Randall reported that Waterman described his companions on the climb as wind, the snow, and death. Cornices as airy as the meringue jutted over voids of mile deep. The vertical ice walls were as crumbly as buckets of ice cubes half thawed, then refrozen. They led to ridges so narrow and so steep on both sides that straddling was the easiest solution. At times, the pain and loneliness overwhelmed him, and he broke down and cried. After 81 days of exhausting, extremely hazardous climbing, Waterman reached the 14,573-foot summit of Hutner. Hunter, which rises in the Alaska Range immediately south of Denali. Another nine weeks were required to make the only slightly less harrowing descent, a total waterman spent 145 days alone on the mountain. When he got back to civilization, flat broke, he borrowed $20 from Cliff Hudson, the bush pilot who'd flown him out to the mountains and returned to Fairbanks, where he only worked, the only work he could find was washing dishes. Waterman was nevertheless hailed as a hero by the small fraternity of Fairbanks climbers. He gave a public slideshow of the Hunter Ascent that Brady calls unforgettable. It was an incredible performance, completely uninhibited. He poured all his thoughts and feelings, his fear of failure, his fear of death. It was like you were there with him. In the months following the epic deed, though, Waterman discovered that instead of putting his demons to rest, success had merely agitated them. Waterman's mind began to unravel. John was very self-critical, always amazing himself, Brady recalls, and he'd always been kind of compulsive. He used to carry around a stack of clipboards and notepads. He'd take copious notes, creating a complete record of everything he did during the course of each day. I remember running into him once in downtown Fairbanks. As I walked up, he got out of a, out a clipboard, logged in the time he saw me, and recorded what our conversation was about, which wasn't much at all. His notes on our meeting were three or four pages down, behind all the other stuff he'd already scribbled that day. Somewhere he must have had piles and piles and piles of notes like that, which I'm sure would have made sense to no one but John. Soon thereafter, Waterman ran for the local school board on a platform promoting unrestricted sex for students and the legalization of hallucinogenic drugs. He lost the election to nobody's surprise save his own, but immediately launched another political campaign, this time for the presidency of the United States. He ran under the banner of the Feed the Starving Party, the main priority of which was to ensure that nobody in the planet died of hunger. To publicize his campaign, he laid plans to make a solo ascent of the south face of Denali, the mountain's steepest aspect, in, in winter with a minimum of food. He wanted to underscore the waste and immorality of the standard American diet. As part of his training regimen for the climb, he immersed himself in bathtubs filled with ice. Waterman filled to the Kahatna Dutt Glacier in December 1979 to begin the ascent, but called it off after only 14 days. Take me home, he reportedly told the bush pilot. I don't want to die. Two months later, however, he prepared for a second attempt. But in Tal Talkeetna, a village south of Denali that is the point of embarkation for most mountaineering expeditions into the Alaska Range. The cabin he was staying in caught fire and burned to rubble, 
incinerating both his equipment and the voluminous accumulation of notes, poetry, and personal journals that he regarded as his life's work. Waterman was completely unhelmed by the loss. The day after the fire, he committed himself to the Anchorage Psychiatric Institute, but left after two weeks, convinced there was a conspiracy afoot to put him away permanently. Then in the winter of 1981, he launched yet another solo attempt on Denali. As if climbing the peak alone in winter weren't challenging enough, this time he decided to put up the ante to up the ante even further by beginning his ascent at sea level, which entailed walking 160 hard, circuitous miles from the shore of Cook Inlet just to reach the foot of the mountain. He started plodding north from Tidewater in Virgi February, but his enthusiasm fizzled in the lower reaches of the Ruth Glacier still 30 miles from the peak, so he aborted the, the attempt and retreated to Tilkitna. In March, however, he mustered his resolve once more and resumed his lonely trek. Before leaving town, he told the pilot of Cliff Hudson, whom he regarded as a friend, I won't be seeing you again. It was an exceptionally cold March in the Alaska Range. Late in the month, Mug Stump crossed paths with watermen on the upper Ruth Glacier, Stump and alpinist of World renowned, had, who died on Denali in 1992, had just completed a difficult new route in the nearby peak, the Moose's Tooth. Shortly after his chance encounter with Waterman, Stump visited me in Seattle and remarked that John didn't seem like he was all there. He was acting spacey and talking some crazy shit. Supposedly, he was doing his big winter ascent of Denali but he had hardly any gear with him. He was wearing a cheap one-piece snowmobile suit and wasn't even carrying a sleeping bag. All he had in the way of food was a bunch of flour, some sugar, and a big can of Crisco. In his book, Breaking Point, Glenn Randall writes, For several weeks, Waterman lingered in the area of Sheldon Mountain, a small cabin perched on Waterman's perched on the side of the Ruth Glacier in the heart of the range. Kate Bull, a friend of Waterman's who was climbing in the area at the time, reported that he was run down and less cautious than usual. He used the radio he had borrowed from Cliff Hudson to call him and have him fly in more supplies. Then he returned the radio as he, as he had borrowed. I won't be needing this anymore, he said. The radio would have been his only means of calling for help. Waterman was last placed in the northwest fork of Ruth Glacier on April 1st. His tracks led toward the east buttress of Denali, straight through a labyrinth of giant crevices, evidence that he had made no apparent effort to circumvent obvious hazards. He was not, even, he was not seen again. It is assumed he broke through a thin snow bridge and plummeted to his death at the bottom of one of the deep fissures. The National Park Service searched Waterman's intended route from the air for a week following his disappearance, but found no signs of him. Some climbers later discovered a note atop a book box of Waterman's gear inside the Sheldon Mountain House, 31381 it read, My Last Kiss, 1.42 p.m. Perhaps inevitably parallels have been made between John Waterman and Chris McCandless. Comparisons have also been drawn between McCandless and Carl McCunn, an affable, abs absent-minded Texan who moved to Fairbanks during the 1970s oil boom and found lucrative employment on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline construction project. In early March 1981, as Waterman was making his final journey into the Alaska Range, McCunn hired a bush pilot to drop him at a remote lake near the Colleen River, about 75 miles northeast of Fort Yukon on the southern margin of the Brooks Range. A 35-year-old amateur photographer, McCunn told friends that his main reason for the trip was to shoot pictures of wildlife. He flew into the country with 500 rolls of film, .22 and .3 caliber rifles, a shotgun, and 1,400 pounds of provisions. His intention was to remain in the wilderness through August. Somehow, though, he neglected to arrange for the pilot to fly him back to civilization at summer's end, and it cost McCunn his life. This astounding oversight wasn't a great surprise to Mark Stopel, a young Fairbanks resident who had come to know McCunn well during the nine months they worked on the pipeline together, shortly before the lanky Texan departed for the Brooks Range. Carl was a friendly, extremely popular, down-home sore guy, Stopel recalls, and he, and he seemed like a smart guy, but there was a side to him that was a little bit dreamy, a little bit out of touch with reality. He was flamboyant. He liked to party hard. 
He could be extremely responsible, but he had a tendency to wing it sometimes, to act impulsively, to get by on bravado and style. No, I guess it wasn't, didn't really surprise me that Carl went out there and forgot to arrange to be picked up. But then I'm not easily shocked. I've had several friends who drowned or got murdered or died in weird accidents. In Alaska, you get used to strange stuff happening. In late August, as the days grew shorter and the air turned sharp and autumnal in the Brooks Range, McCunn began to worry about nobody, that nobody arrived to fly him out. I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure, he confessed in his diary, significant portions of which were published posthumously in a five-part story by Chris Capps in the Fairbanks Daily Mi News Miner. I'll soon find out. Week by week, he could feel the accelerating advance of winter. As his food supply grew meager, McCunn deeply regretted tossing all his dozen, all but a dozen of his shotgun shells into the lake. I keep thinking of all the shotgun shells I threw away about two months ago, he wrote. Had five boxes, and when I kept seeing them sitting there, I felt rather silly for having brought so many. Felt like a warmonger, real bright. Who would have known I might need them just to keep from starving? Then on the brisk September morning, deliverance seemed to be at hand. McCunn was stalking ducks with, an, with what remained of his ammunition when the skit stillness was rocked by the buzz of an airplane, which soon appeared overhead. The pilot spotting the camp circled twice at a low altitude for a closer look. McCunn waved wildly with a fluorescent orange sleeping bag cover. The aircraft was equipped with wheels rather than floats and thus couldn't land, but McCunn was certain he had seen that no doubt the pilot would summon a float plane to return for him. He was so, so sure this, he recorded it in the journal, that I stopped waving after the first pass. I got, I then got busy packing things up and getting ready to break camp. But no airplane arrived that day or the next day or the next. Eventually, McCunn looked on the back of his hunting license and understood why. Printed on the little square of paper were drawings of emergency hand signals for communicating with aircraft from the ground. I recall raising my hand, shoulder high, and shaking my fist on the plane's second pass. It was a little cheer, like when your team scored a touchdown or something. Unfortunately, as he learned too late, raising a single arm is the universally recognized single for all okay, assistance not necessary. The single for SOS, send immediate help, is two upraised arms. That's probably why after they flew somewhat away, they returned for one more pass, and on that one, I gave no signal at all. In fact, I may have even turned my back to the plane as it passed, McCunn mused philosoph philosophically. They probably blew me off as a weirdo. By the end of September, snow was piling up on the tundra, and the lake had frozen over. As the provisions he'd brought ran out, McCunn made an effort to gather rose hips and snare rabbits. At one point, he managed to scavenge meat with, from, from a diseased caribou that had wandered into the lake and died. By October, however, he had metabolized most of his body fat and was having difficulty staying warm during the long, cold nights. Certainly someone in town should have figured something must be wrong. Me not being back by now, he noted, but still no plane appeared. It would be just like Carl to assume that somebody would magically appear to save him, said Stoffel. He, he was a teamster. He drove a truck, so he had plenty of downtime on the job, just sitting on his butt inside his rig, daydreaming, which is how he came up with the idea for the Brooks Range trip. It was a serious quest for him. He spent the better part of a year thinking about it, planning it, figuring it out, talking to me during the breaks about what gear to take. But for all the careful planning he did, he also indulged in some wild fantasies. For instance, Stoffel continues, Carl didn't want to fly into the bush alone. His big dream originally was to go off and live in the woods with some beautiful woman. He was hot for at least a couple of different girls who worked with us, and he spent a lot of time and energy trying to talk Sue or Barbara or whoever into accompanying him, which in itself was pretty much pure fantasy land. There was no way it was going to happen. I mean, at the pipeline camp where we worked, Pump Station 7. There were probably 40 guys for every woman, but Carl was a dreaming kind of dude, and right up until he flew into the Brooks Range, he kept hoping and hoping and hoping that one of these girls would change her mind and decide to go with him. Similarly, similarly Stoppel explains, Carl was the sort of guy who would have unrealistic expectations that someone would eventually figure out he was in trouble and cover for him. 
Even as he was on the verge of starving, he probably still imagined that Big Sue was going to fly in at the last minute with a plain load of food and have his wild romance with him. But his fantasy world was so far off the scale that nobody was able to connect with it. Carl just got hungrier and hungrier. By the time he finally understood that nobody was going to come rescue him, he'd shriveled up to the point where he had, was too late for him to do anything about it. As McCunn's food supply dwindled to almost nothing, he wrote in his journal, I'm getting more and more worried. To be honest, I'm starting to be a bit scared. The thermometer dipped to minus five degrees Fahrenheit. Painful pus-filled frostbite blisters formed in his fingers and toes. In November, he finished the last of his rations. He felt weak and dizzy. Chills racked his gaunt frame. The diary recorded hands and nose continued to get slow and agonizing way to die. McCunn considered leaving the security of his camp and set, setting out on foot for Fort Yukon, but concluded he wasn't strong enough, that he would succumb to exhaustion and the cold long, be the cold long before he got there. The part of the interior where Carl went is remote. Very blank part of Alaska, says Stoffel. It gets colder than hell there in the winter. Some people in this situation could have figured out a way to walk out or maybe winter over. But to do that, you'd have to be extremely resourceful. You'd really need to have your shit together. You'd have to get be a tiger, a killer, a fucking animal. And Carl was too laid back. He was a pretty boy. I can't go on like this. I'm afraid, McCunn wrote sometime in his late November near the end of the journal which by now filled with 100 sheets of blue line, loose paved no leaf notebook paper. Dear God in heaven, please forgive me, my weaknesses and my sins. Please look over my family. And then he reclined in his wall, wall tent, placed the muzzle of his 3030 against his head and jerked his thumb down on the trigger. Two months later on February 2nd, 1982, Alaska state troopers came across his camp, looked inside the tent, and discovered the emaciated corpse frozen hard as stone. There are similarities among Rosalini, Waterman, McCann, and McCandless. Like Rosalini and Waterman, McCandless was a seeker and had an impractical fascination with the harsh side of nature. Like Waterman and McCann, he displayed a staggering paucity of common sense. But unlike Waterman, McCandless wasn't mentally ill. And unlike McCunn, he didn't go into the bush assuming someone would automatically appear to save his bacon before he came to grief. McCandless didn't conform particularly well to the bush casualty stereotype. Although he was rash, untutored in the ways of backcountry, and incautious to the point of foolhardiness, he wasn't incompetent. He wouldn't have lasted 113 days if he were, and he wasn't a nutcase. He wasn't a sociopath. He wasn't an outcast. McCandless was something else, although precisely what is hard to say. A pilgrim, perhaps. Some insight into the tragedy of Chris McCandless can be gained by studying predecessors cut from the same exotic cloth. And in order to do that, one must look beyond Alaska to the bald rock canyons of southern Utah. There, in 1934, a peculiar 24-year-old boy walked into the desert and never came out. His name was Everett Bruce. Okay, chapter nine. As to when I shall visit civilization, it will not be soon. I think I have not tri tired of the wilderness. Rather, I enjoy its beauty and the vagrant life I lead, more keenly all the time. I prefer the saddle to the streetcar and star-sprinkled sky to a roof, the, the obscure and difficult trail leading into the unknown to any paved highway, and the deep peace of mind of wild to the discontent bred by cities. Do you blame me then for, swaying, for staying here, where I feel that I belong and one with the world around me? It is true that I miss intelligent companionship, but there, but there are so few with whom I can share the things that mean so much to me, that I have learned to contain myself. It is enough that I am surrounded with beauty. Even from your scant description, I know that I could not bear the routine and humdrum of life that you are forced to lead. I don't think I could ever settle down. I have known too much of the depths of life already, and I would prefer anything to an anticlimax. The last letter received from Everett Roos to his brother Waldo dated November 11th, 1984. When Everett Roos was after, what, what, what Everett Roos was after was beauty, and he conceived beauty in pretty romantic terms. 
We might be inclined to laugh at the extravagance of his beauty worship if there were not something almost magnificent in his single-minded dedication to it. Aesthetics is a parlor, pallor, affectionate, affection in ludicrous and sometimes a little obscene. As a way of life, it sometimes attains dignity. If we laugh at Everett Roos, we shall have a laugh at John Muir, because there was little difference between them except age. Written by Wallace Stegner and Mormon Country. Davis Creek is only a trickle during most of the year and sometimes not even that. Originating at the foot of the high rock battlement known as 50 Mile Point, the stream flows just four miles across the pink sandstone slabs of southern Utah before surrendering its modest waters of Lake Powell, the giant reservoir that stretches 190 miles above Glen Canyon Dam. Davis Gulch is a small watershed by any measure, but a lovely one, and travelers through this dry, hard country have, their, have for centuries relied on the oasis that exists at the bottom of this slot-like defile. Eerie 900-year-old petroglyphs and pictographs decorate its sheer walls. Crumbling stone dwellings of the long-lavished Kietna Anazai, the creators of this rock art, nestle in the protective nooks. Ancient Anazai post herds mingle in the sand with rusty tin cans discarded by a turn-of-the-century stockman who grazed and watered their animals in the canyon. For most of the short length, Davis Gulch exists as a deep, twisting gash in the sl sl slick rock, narrow enough in places to spit across, lined by overhanging sandstone walls that bar access to the canyon floor. There is a hidden route into the gulch as its lower end, however, just upstream from where Davis Creek flows into Lake Powell. A natural ramp zigzags down from the canyon's west rim. Not far above the creek bottom, the ramp ends, and a crude staircase appears, chiseled into the soft sandstone by Mormon cattlemen clearly a near century. The country surrounding Davis Gulch is a desiccated expanse of bald rock and brick, re brick red sand. Vegetation is lean, shade from the withering sun is virtually non-existent. To descend into the confines of the canyon, however, is to arrive in another world. Cottonwoods lean gracefully over drifts of flowering prickly pear. Tall grasses sway in the breeze. The ephemeral blossom of a bloom of a sego lily peaks in the toe of a 90-foot stone arch, and canyon wrens call back and forth in plaintive tones from the thatch of scrub oak. High above the creek, a spring seeps from a cliff face, irrigating the growth of moss and maiden hair fern that hangs from a rock in lush green mats. Six decades ago in the enchanting hideaway, less than a mile downstream from where the Mormon steps meet the floor of the gulch, 20-year-old Everett Roos carved his nom de plume into the canyon wall below a panel of NSI pictograph, and he did so again in the doorway of a small masonry structure built by the NSI of for storing grain. Nemo 1934, he scrawled. No Doubt, moved by the same impulse that compelled Chris McCandles to inscribe Alexander Supertramp, May 1992, on the wall of the Shoshana bus, an impulse not so different, perhaps, from that, that which inspired the Anazai to embellish the rock with their own now indecipherable symbols. In any case, shortly after Roos carved his mark into the sandstone, he departed Davis Gulch and mysteriously disappeared, apparently by design. An extensive search shed no light on his whereabouts. He was simply gone, swallowed whole by the desert. Sixty years later, we still know next to nothing about what became of him. Everett was born in Oakland, California in 1914, the younger of two sons. Raised by Christopher and Stella Roos, Christopher, a graduate of Harvard Divinity School, was a poet, a philosopher, and a Unitarian minister, although he earned his keep as a bureaucrat in the California penal system. Stella was a headstrong woman with a bohemian taste and driving artistic ambitions for both herself and her kin. She self-published a literary journal, the Roos Quartet, the cover of which was emblazoned with the family maxim, glorify the hour. A tight-knit bunch, the Rooses were also a nomadic family, moving from Oakland to Fresno to Los Angeles to Boston to Brooklyn to New Jersey to Indiana, before finally settling in Southern California, wherever it was 14. 
In Los Angeles, Everett attended the Otis Art School in Hollywood High. As a 16-year-old, he embarked on his first long solo trip, spending the summer of 1930 hitchhiking and trekking through Yosemite and Big Sur, ultimately winding up in Camp Carmel. Two days after arriving in the latter community, he brazenly knocked on the door of Edward Weston, who was sufficiently charmed by the overwrought young man to humor him. Over the next two months, the eminent photographer encouraged the boy's uneven but promising efforts at painting and rock printing, and permitted Roos to hang around his studio with his own sons, Neil and Cole. At the end of the summer, Everett returned home only long enough to earn a high school diploma, which he received in January of 1931. Less than a week, a month later, he was on the road again, tramping alone through the canyon lands of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico, then a region nearly as sparsely populated and wrapped in mystique as Alaska is today. Except for a short, unhappy stint at the UCLA, he dropped out after a single semester to his father's lasting dismay. Two extended visits with his parents and a winter in San Francisco, where he insinuated himself into the company of Dorothea Lang, Ansel Adams, and the painter Manor Dixon. Roos would spend the remainder of his, red, his meteoric life on the move, living out of backpack on very little money, sleeping in the dirt, cheerfully going hungry for days at a time. Roos was, in the words of Wallace Stegner, a callow romantic, an adolescent esthete, an atavistic wanderer, wanderer of the wastelands. At 18 and a dream, he saw himself plodding through jungles, chinning up the ledges of cliffs, wandering through the romantic waste places of the world. No man with any of the juices of boyhood in him had forgotten those dreams. The peculiar thing about Everett Roos was that he went out and did the things he dreamed about, not simply for two weeks vacation in the, civil in the civilized and trimmed wonderlands, but for months and years in the very midst of wonder. Deliberately, he punished his body, stained his, strained his endurance, tested his capacity for strenuousness. He took out deliberately over trails that Indians and old-timers warned him against. He tackled cliffs that were more than once left him dangling halfway be between talus and rim. From his camps by the water pockets or the canyons or high on the timbered ridges of Navajo Mountain, he wrote long, lush, enthusiastic letters to his family and friends damning the stereotypes of civilization, chanting his barbaric adolescent yawp into the teeth of the world. Roos churned out many such letters, which bore the postmarks of the remote settlements through which he passed. Quieta, Chenil, Lubichi, Zion Canyon, Grand Canyon, Mesa Verde, Escalante, Rainbow Bridge, Canyon de Chile, Reading his correspondence collected by W. L. Ruscio's meticulously researched biography, Everett Roos, a, va a Vagabond for Beauty, one is struck by Roos's craving for connection to, with the natural world and by his almost incendiary passion for the country through which he walked. I had some terrific experiences in the wilderness since I wrote you last. Overpowering, overwhelming, he gushed to his friend Cornell Tangle. But then I am always being overwhelmed. I require it to be to sustain life. Everett Roos's correspondence reveals uncanny parallels between Roos and Chris McCandles. Here's an excerpt from three of Roos's letters. I have been thinking more and more that I shall always be a lone wanderer of the wilderness. God, how the trail lures me. You cannot comprehend its restlessness, fascination for me. His, its resistless fascination for me. After all, the lone trail is the best. I've never stopped wondering. And then the time comes to die. I'll find the wildest, loneliest, most desolate spot there is. The beauty of this country is becoming part of me. I feel more detached from life and somehow gentler. I have some good friends here, but no one who really understands why I'm here or what I do. I don't know of anyone, though, who would have more than a partial understanding. I have gone too far alone. I've always been unsatisfied with life, as many people live it. Always I want to live more intensely and richly. In my wanderings this year, I have taken more chances and had more wild adventures than ever before. In what magnificent country I have seen, wild, treme tremendous wasteland stretches, lost mesas, blue mountains rearing upward from the vermilion sands of the desert, canyons five feet wide at the bottom and hundreds of feet deep, cloudbursts roaring down unnamed canyons and hundreds of houses of the cliff dwellers abandoned a thousand years ago.
A half century later, McCandless sounds eerily like Roos when he declares in a postcard to Wayne Westerberg that I've decided that I'm going to live this life for some time to come. The freedom and simple beauty of it is just too good to pass up. And echoes of Roos's can be heard as well in McCandless's last letter to Ronald France. Roos was just as romantic as McCandless, if not more so, and equally heedless of personal safety. Claiborne Lockett, an archaeologist, archaeologist who briefly employed Roos as a cook while excavating an NSI, NSI cliff dwelling in 1934, told Ruschel that he was appalled by the seemingly reckless manner in which Everett moved around dangerous cliffs. And did indeed Roos himself boast in one of his letters hundreds of times, I have trusted my life to crumbling sandstone and nearly vertical edges in the search for water or cliff dwellings. Twice I was nearly gored to death by wild bull. But always so far, I've escaped unscathed and gone forth to other adventures. And in his final letter, Roos nonchalantly confesses to his brother. I have had a few narrow escapes from the rattlers and crumbling cliffs. The last misadventure occurred when Chocoltero, his burro, stirred up some wild bees. A few more stings might have been too much for me. I was three or four days getting my eyes open and recovering the use of my hands. Also like McCandles, Roos was undeterred by physical discomfort. At times, he seemed to welcome it. For day, six days, I've been suffering from the semi-annual poison ivy case. My sufferings are far from over, he tells his friend Bill Jacobs. He goes on, for two days, I couldn't tell whether I was dead or alive. I writhed and twisted in the heat with swarms of ants and flies crawling over me while the poison oozed and crusted on my face and arms and back. I ate nothing. There was nothing to do but suffer philosophically. I get it every time, but I refuse to be driven out of the woods. And my, like McCandless, upon embarking on his terminal odyssey, Roos adopted a new name, or rather a series of new names. In a letter dated March 1st, 1931, he informed his family that he had taken to calling himself Lan Rameau and request that they please respect my bush name. How do you say it in French? Nom de bruche or what? Two months later, however, another letter explains that I have changed my name again to Everett Rulon. Those who knew me formerly thought my name was freakish and an affection for Frenchiness. And then in August of that same year, and with no explanation, he goes back to calling himself Everett Roos and continues to do so for the next three years until watering it, wandering into Davis Gulch. There, for some unknowable reason, Everett twice etched the name Nemo, Latin for nobody, into the soft Navajo sandstone, and then vanished. He was 20 years old. The last letters anyone received from Roos were posted from the Mormon settlement of Escalante, 57 miles north of Davis Gulch on November 11th, 1934. Addressed to his parents and his brother, they indicate that he would be incommunicado for a month or two. Eight days after mailing them, Roos encountered two shepherds about a mile from the gulch and spent two nights in their camp. These men were the last people known to have seen the youth alive. Some three months after Roos departed Escalante, his parents received a bundle of unopened mail forwarded from the postmaster at Marble Canyon, Arizona where Everett was long overdue. Worried Christopher and Stella Roos contacted the authorities in Escalante, who arrived in, in a search party in early March 1935. Starting from the sheep came where Roos was last seen. They began combing in the surrounding country and very quickly found Everett's two burros in the bottom of Davis Gulch, grazing contentedly behind the makeshift coral fashioned from bush and tree limbs. The burros were confined in the upper canyon just upstreet from where the Mormon steps intersect the floor of the gulch. A short distance downstream, the searchers found unmistakable evidence of Roos's camp, and then in the doorway of the Anasai granary, granary, below a magnificent natural arch, they came across Nemo 1934, carved into a stone slab. Four Anasai pots were carefully arranged on a rock nearby. Three months later, searchers came across another Nemo graffiti. A little further down the gulch, the rising waters of Lake Powell, which began to fill upon the completion of Glen Canyon Dam in 1963, have long since erased both inscriptions. 
But except for the burros and their tack, none of the Rus's possessions, his camping paraphernalia, journals, and planting, paintings was ever found. It is widely believed that Rus fell to his death while scrambling on one of another on one or another canyon wall. Given the treacherous nature of the local topography, most of the cliffs that riddle the region were composed of Navajo sandstone, a crumbly stratum that erodes into smooth, bulging precipices. The Rus's penchant for dangerous climbing, this is a credible scenario. Careful searches of cliffs near and far, however, have failed to unearth any human remains. And how to account for the fact that Rus apparently left the gulch with a heavy load of gear, but without his pack animals. These bewildering circumstances have led some investigators to conclude that Roos was murdered by a team of cattle rustlers, known to have been in the area, who then stole his belongings and buried his remains or threw him into the Colorado River. This theory, too, is plausible, but no concrete evidence exists to prove it. Shortly after Everett's disappearance, his father suggested that the boy had probably been inspired to call himself Nemo by Jules Verne's 20,000 League Under the Sea, a book Everett read many times in which he, the pure-hearted protagonist, Captain Nemo, flees civilization and serves his every, uh, every tie upon the earth, severs every tie upon the earth. Everett's biographer, W.L. Rusha, agrees with Christopher Roos's assessment, arguing that Everett's withdrawal from the organized society, his disdain for the worldly pleasures, and his signatures as Nemo and David Gulch all strongly suggest that he closely identified with the Jules Verne character. Roos's apparent fascination with Captain Nemo was fed speculation among more than a few Roos mythographers that Everett pulled a fast one on the world after leaving Davis Gulch and is or was very much alive quietly residing somewhere under an assumed identity. A year ago, while filling his truck with gas in Kingman, Arizona, I happened to strike up a conversation about Roos and the middle-aged pump attendant, a small, twitchy man with flecks of skull staining the corners of his mouth. Speaking with persuasive conviction, he swore that he, was, he knew a fella who definitely bumped into Roos. In the late 1960s, at a remote Hogan in the Navajo Indian Reservation, According to the attendant's friend, Roos was married to a Navajo woman, with whom he'd raised at least one child. The veracity of this and other reports of relatively recent Roos sightings, needlessly to say, is extremely suspect. Ken Slight, who has spent as much time investigating the riddle of Everett Roos as any other person, is convinced that the boy died in 1934 or early 1935 and believes he knows how Roos might have met his end. Slate, 65-year-old, is a professional river guide and desert rat with a Mormon upbringing and a reputation for insolence. When Edward Abbey was writing The Monkey Wrench Gang, his picturesque novel about ecotourism in the canyon country, his pal Ken Slate was said to have inspired the character Seldom Seen Smith. Slate was, had lived in the region for 40 years, visited virtually all the places Roos visited, talked to many people who crossed paths with Roos, taken Roos's older brother Waldo into Davis Gulch to visit the site of Everett's disappearance. Waldo thinks Everett's was murdered, Slate says, but I don't think so. I lived in Escalante for two years. I've talked with the folks who were, were accused of killing him, and I just don't think they did it. But who knows? You can't never really tell what a person does in secret. Other folks believe Everett fell off a cliff. Well, yeah, he could have done that. It, it'd be an easy thing to do in that country, but I don't think that's what happened. I tell you what I think. I think he drowned. Years ago, while hiking down Grand Gulch, a tributary of the San Juan River, some 45 miles due east of Davis Gulch, Slate discovered the name Nemo carved into the soft mud mortar of the Anazai granary. Slate speculates that Roos inscribed this Nemo long, not long after departing Davis Gulch. After corralling his burros in Davis, says Slate, Roos hid all his stuff in a cave somewhere and took off playing Captain Nemo. He had Indian friends down on the Navajo reservation, and that's where I think he was heading. A logical route to Navajo country would have taken Roos across the Colorado River at Hole in the Rock, then along the rugged trail pioneered in 1880 by Mormon settlers across Wilson Mesa and the Clay Hills. And finally, down Grand Gulch, 
in the, San, in the San Juan River, across which lay the reservation. Everett carved his Nemo on the ruin in the Grand Gulch, about a mile below where Collins Creek comes in, then continued on down to the San Juan. And when he tried to swim across the river, he drowned. That's what I think. Slate believes that if Roos had made it across the river alive and reached the reservation, it would have been impossible for him to conceal his presence, even if he was still playing his Nemo game. Everett was a loner, but he liked people too damn much to stay down there and live in secret the rest of his life. A lot of us are like that. I'm like that. Ed Abbey was like that. And it sounds like this Chris McCandles kid was like that. We like companionship, see, but we can't stand to be around people for very long. So we go out, get ourselves lost, come back for a while, then get the hell out again. And that's what Everett was doing. Everett was strange, Slate concedes, kind of different. But him and McCandless, at least they tried to follow their dream. That's what was great about them. They tried, and not many do. In attempting to understand Everett Roos and Chris McCandless, it can be illuminating to consider their deeds in a larger context. It is helpful to look at counterparts from a distant place and a century far removed. Off the southeastern coast of Iceland sits a low barrier island called Papos, treeless and rocky, perpetually clobbered by gales hollowing off the North Atlantic. It takes its name from its first settlers, now, now long gone, the Irish monks known as Papar. Walking these gnarled, these gnarled shore one summer afternoon, I blundered upon a matrix of faint stone rectangles embedded in the tundra, vestiges of the monks' ancient dwellings, hundreds of years older even than the Anasai ruins in Davis Gulch. The monks arrived as early as the 5th and 6th centuries AD, having sailed and rowed from the west coast of Ireland, setting out in small open boats called curas, built from cowhide stretched over light wicker frames. They crossed one of the most treacherous stretches of ocean in the world without knowing what, if anything, they'd find on the other side. The pepper risked their lives and lost them in untold droves not to the pursuit of wealth or personal glory or to claim new lands in the name of any despot. As the great Arctic explorer and Nobel laureate Fritjoy Nansen points out, these remarkable voyages were undertaken chiefly from the wish to find lonely places where these authorities might dwell in peace, undisturbed by the turmoil and temptations of the world. When the first handful of Norwegians showed up on the shores of Iceland in the ninth century, the papper decided the country was, had become too crowded, even though it was still all but uninhabited. The monks' response was a, to climb into their curaws and row off toward Greenland. They were drawn across the storm-wracked ocean, drawn west past the edge of the known world, by nothing more than a hunger of the spirit, a yearning of such queer intensity that it beggars the modern imagination. Reading of these monks, one moved by their courage, their reckless innocence, and the urgency of their desire. Reading of these monks, one can't help thinking of Everett Bruce and Chris McCandles.